right, good to have you with us on this Friday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to begin our show with the police crackdown on pro-Palestinian protests on college campuses from coast to coast. The demonstrators are protesting against the war in Gaza and calling on their schools to divest from Israel. This is the scene at UCLA in the wake of what we saw 24 hours ago. Police stormed and dismantled a protester encampment yesterday, arresting more than 200 people. A tally by NBC News has found that across the country, more than 2,000 have been arrested over the past three weeks. Yesterday in L.A., police dressed in riot gear, used flashbang devices to clear out protesters and take down their massive encampment. Demonstrators have criticized the police tactics as excessive and say the fight is not over until their demands are met. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has more out of Los Angeles. Well, hey, guys, good morning to you. Yeah, it's a much different scene here outside UCLA than it was just 24 hours ago when at this very time we were here as hundreds of law enforcement in riot gear charged into what was an encampment behind me and forced some 500 people who had been camping out for a week here to disperse. Some, though, got arrested. More than 200 were arrested, and they did not uh, dispersed without a very contentious fight. This was a very uh, heated, confrontational uh, situation yesterday morning. And now here we are. Things have begun to get cleaned up, but they did leave behind a lot of mess. The famous Royce Hall here behind me has graffiti all over it. And so there's going to be a long cleanup still in the many in the coming days. Now, meantime, across the country, up at Portland State University, there was a pretty uh, intense situation uh, with video showing a car driving towards a pro-Palestinian protest. The driver then appears to pep, uh, spray pepper spray toward the crowd. Portland State Police say a man was detained on a mental health hold. Meanwhile, at Columbia University in New York, the epicenter of the protest, overnight protesters showed up outside the home of the Columbia University president. This comes just days after that raid on one of the buildings there. And now police body camera footage from the NYPD that shows some of the moments that this all happened. A big question that officials have been having is how many of the people camping out have been students, faculty, or how many have been outside agitators. And interestingly, according to the NYPD, of the 282 people arrested at Columbia and the City College of New York, this is according to the mayor as well, over half the mayor's office and NYPD say over half were not affiliated with those schools. Now, by NBC News' count, more than 2,100 people have been arrested nationwide since these protests began. Back here at UCLA, there's a big question about what's next. This whole area is blocked off at least through today, but we know these protesters have said they are not going to end their movement until their demands for the university to divest from Israel are met. Their next move, though, remains to be seen. Back to you guys. All right, Liz, thank you so much. Well, facing growing political pressure, President Biden is responding to the demands of pro-Palestinian protesters at college campuses across the country weeks after the demonstrations began at Columbia University. The president says he will not change his support for Israel. That decision is having an impact on the polls ahead of the 2024 election. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez reports. <laughs> President Biden's condemnation of violent campus protests are his first on-camera comments about the growing controversy in more than a week. There's the right to protest, but not the right to cause chaos. The president says he won't call in the National Guard, and he bluntly rejected the protesters' demands to change his policy in the Middle East. Mr. President, have the protest forced you to reconsider any of the policies with regard to the region? No. President Biden is facing mounting political pressure. Some Democrats want him to do more to support Palestinians, while many Republicans are blasting him for not speaking out earlier. In moments like this, there are always those who rush in to score political points. But this isn't a moment for politics. It's a moment for clarity. Still, the war is playing a larger role in the 2024 campaign. We demand a ceasefire! For months on the trail, the president's faced growing pro-Palestinian protests. I used to support it until I realized who he really was. But the tensions are boiling over this week. These are radical left lunatics. And they got to be stopped now because it's going to go on and on. Former President Trump is praising the police response at Columbia University. It was a beautiful thing to watch. New York's finest. 
But Mr. Trump is also drawing controversy for an interview where he would not commit to respecting the outcome of the election, saying if everything's honest, I'll gladly accept the results. If it's not, you have to fight for the right of the country. The president firing back. Mr. President, are you worried that Trump says he won't accept the election results? Back to the president's remarks, they were a last-minute add to his schedule, but the White House insists the president was not bowing to political pressure. Biden campaign officials, meanwhile, previously downplayed the college protest, arguing that young people care more about other issues, like the economy and abortion rights. Back to you. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, thank you so much. Despite political tensions here at home, the Biden administration is ramping up pressure on both Israel and Hamas to reach a ceasefire deal before the IDF carries out its offensive operation in Rafah. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says Israel has made very important compromises in the latest proposal to Hamas leaders, and Hamas seems to be responsive to those changes. They say they view the negotiations in a positive light, adding a delegation will be joining Israeli officials in Cairo to continue talks of a ceasefire. The optimism over a potential deal comes as the reality worsens in Gaza. A new UN report finds Gazans will become fully dependent on outside aid within the next three months. Nearly 75% of Gazans have been displaced since the war began. NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now from Tel Aviv with the latest. Raf, good morning. So how has the position of Hamas changed in the last week? How much is pressure from the Biden administration playing a role here? Chair Savannah, good morning. The world has been waiting now for several days for Hamas to give its response to the current ceasefire proposal. Israel's war cabinet met here in Tel Aviv last night, and they believed that they were going to get that response, a yes or a no, last night. Instead, Hamas indicating it wants to continue talking. The political leader of Hamas, Ismail Haniyeh, calling the head of Egyptian intelligence, who's been one of the absolute key mediators throughout these talks, telling him that Hamas negotiators will come to Egypt as soon as possible to complete the ongoing discussions with the aim of maturing an agreement. Now, guys, I've read a lot of Hamas statements since October 7th. On the one hand, this has positive sounds in it that Hamas feels that there is something worth discussing, worth going to Cairo to discuss, but it is also clear that they are not planning to give a definitive answer one way or another right now. Israel says it will not wait forever and that it is preparing to move ahead with that threatened defensive into the city of Rafah where a million Palestinian civilians are sheltering. That is despite firm opposition from the White House. And Hamas says if Israel moves ahead with that attack, that's the end of the negotiations. Guys. Uh, Raf, it feels like we've been here before, right? Optimism for a deal that then eventually fades away. Do things feel different this time? It's really hard to say, Savannah. There is a lot of international pressure in all directions. The ceasefire deal, you can see the terms on your screen there. Hamas being asked to release 33 hostages from the so-called humanitarian category. That is women, it's children, children, it's the elderly, it's people with serious medical conditions. In return, Israel would release potentially thousands of Palestinian prisoners and agree to a 40-day ceasefire. Israeli officials say they've also made concessions on this question of allowing Palestinian civilians to return to their homes in northern Gaza. The U.S. says this is, these are very generous terms to Hamas. But what Hamas officials are telling us is that one of the absolute key sticking points is whether this is a negotiation about a temporary pause in the fighting, which is what Israel wants, or whether this is a negotiation about ending the war altogether, which is what Hamas wants, and trying to bridge the gap between between those kind of zero-sum positions is one of the key, key tasks of the mediators right now. Guys. Uh, Raph, while we have you, Secretary of State Antony Blinken ended his tour of the Middle East this week by offering suggestions on how to best protect Gazans. What did he say? So, Joe, a lot of this tour was focused on a ceasefire deal. A lot of it was focused on Rafa, but a lot of it also focused on this question of getting more humanitarian aid into Gaza. The secretary was there as Israel, for the first time, and frankly, under intense American pressure, allowed aid to go directly through a crossing into northern Gaza. 
the Secretary of State saying that that is a positive development, but that much, much more needs to happen. One of the points he made, Israel needs to be allowing more medicine, not just food, into Gaza. The health care system has all but collapsed inside of the Strip. Health care needs are dire. He says also Israel needs to do more to allow distribution inside of Gaza. So that is easing restrictions inside of the Strip. It's allowing more trucks to get in so they can be used for distribution. And finally, he said Israel needs to stop arbitrarily denying aid from going in. And what we have heard really consistently since the beginning from aid groups is that they arrive at the Rafah crossing or elsewhere and they have what they think is very clearly humanitarian aid and the Israelis say, no, you can't bring this in because it could potentially benefit Hamas. I'll give you just one example, guys. We've heard from aid groups that they have been denied the ability to bring freezers for insulin into Gaza because the Israelis have said that's something that could benefit Hamas. Not clear how that works. Guys. Wow. Ralph Sanchez, as always, thank you for your reporting. Appreciate it. Let's take a look at what to expect the, the weekend weather-wise. Texas bracing for severe storms. Angie Lastman joins us with more of your morning news now weather forecast. Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. We're rolling right through this work week and headed so close to the weekend. But we, of course, continue to see the impactful weather across the middle of the country. Yesterday, in the past 24 hours, really, we picked up some impressive amounts of rain. And the visuals coming out of Texas, as far as the flooding is concerned, uh, have been quite impressive. Notice Huntsville, over nine inches of rain in 24-hour period. We've had nearly 10 inches of rain in Livingston. Those are some of the areas that we've seen really uh, some, some damaging flooding happening uh, and plenty of river flood warnings underway. Notice the amount of moderate and major flooding that's happening along these rivers. Wherever you see that red and wherever you see that pink, that's where we're, we're concerned for the river flooding. We've got a lot of swollen rivers across this region in parts of Texas, and we've also got the flood watches up and specifically some flash flood warnings in effect for parts of Texas. These flood watches extend into Oklahoma as well as Louisiana and topping out about 6 million people right now. The severe weather threat, while it was less yesterday, we still saw a couple of tornadoes. We had reports of hail, and today is kind of more of the same. The middle of the country, still the bullseye for where we're watching, but specifically, we've got a couple of these slight risk areas where our main threat that we're concerned about is going to be the hail, two inch in, uh, in size or potentially larger, but some gusty winds and maybe a couple of tornadoes possible. When it comes to the hail, Lubbock, Abilene, San Angelo, we're watching for golf balls size, something to watch into the afternoon and evening hours tonight. Now, as we roll into the weekend, the severe threat diminishes a little more. We still have a, a section of the country, specifically parts of Texas, same kind of spot, Lubbock, Midland, Fort Stockton, that we're going to watch for some stronger storms. So we'll watch for that here as we get into the day tomorrow. But the rain continues too. We've got one to two inches of rain expected across this region through Sunday. So we've kind of got this repeated performance that we're going to watch as far as these thunderstorms firing up over the same area as we get into the weekend too before we really ramp up that severe weather by Monday and Tuesday. Out west, we've got another Pacific storm. That means, guys, rain and potentially snow for folks out there. So we'll be watching for oh. impactful weather for them as we head through the weekend. But again, Monday, Tuesday, we're really going to be watching the middle of the country for more of those strong storms and severe storm risks. All so, right. Um, Thank you, Angie. So Appreciate it. So cute when we all get the same color. Oh, we did. Look, Look at, at us. us. Now let's get to former <laughs> President Trump's hush money trial here in New York. There were dramatic moments yesterday as a key prosecution witness was cross-examined about the alleged payments he helped arrange. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the latest. Former President Trump arriving at court watching his defense team go on offense, casting a key prosecution witness as out to extort him for money. The defense hoping to discredit Keith Davidson, the lawyer who negotiated payoffs for Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. Both threatened to go public with stories of sex with Mr. Trump ahead of the 2016 election. Mr. Trump has denied the allegations of both women and denied any advance knowledge of the payoffs. His defense team suggesting today Davidson had a habit of shaking down celebrities like Charlie Sheen for money. Davidson saying he never extorted anyone, testifying at length about his negotiations with Michael Cohen, Mr. Trump's former attorney, but admitting he never met nor spoke to the former president.
Instead, he dealt exclusively with Cohen, who he painted as desperate and despondent that then-President-elect Trump would not make him attorney general or White House chief of staff, describing a phone call where Cohen lamented, I can't believe I'm not going to Washington. Cohen saying he'd saved Trump so many times, you don't even know. Davidson testifying about Cohen, I thought he was going to kill himself. A helpful point for the defense as it tries to cast Cohen as having an axe to grind against Mr. Trump. The former president is accused of illegally doctoring his internal records to disguise his repayments to Cohen, making Cohen's testimony critical for prosecutors who are now seeking additional fines against Mr. Trump, saying he violated a gag order again by calling his former fixer a liar. While the defense argues the former president should be allowed to defend himself against Cohen's frequent criticism. That I'm unconstitutionally gagged. He gagged me, so I'm not even supposed to be, I would say, talking to you because he gagged me. Our thanks to Laura Jarrett for that report. For more, we are joined by NBC News legal analyst Angela Sanadella on this. Angela, good morning. So let's talk about this attorney, Keith Davidson. How effective of a witness was he, do you think? So look, he's a very important witness for the prosecution. Aside from Michael Cohen, he's literally the other middleman. So mm. he repped Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal, whereas Michael Cohen repped Trump. Now, the two of them made this deal together. So his testimony was important to trace the money trail. Mm -hmm. And he did just that. He effectively showed his text that said, funds received, which really closed the loop of the money. I also think it's effective that he brought up the election in his text messages, and he showed that he believed that perhaps this hush money deal is literally what tipped the election in Trump's favor. Now, look, that's totally circumstantial. It's just opinion. It's not based in numbers or quantity or fact. But the prosecution has to keep tying this back to the election. Through Laura's reporting, we hear how messy this all is, mm. this whole hush money world. But ultimately, the allegation is that there's, there's this election interference. So the prosecution has to keep bringing that back. Mm. But we did hear the defense say that he's this serial extortionist. And look, it's a fine line between extortion and getting money for NDAs. And that's what the defense is going to keep doing, just constantly attacking every witness of the prosecution for their credibility, saying they are just part of the seedy world. Don't believe them, mm. jury. So it was balanced. It was effective, but it was also effective for the defense. Something else the jury heard yesterday, Trump on tape talking to Michael Cohen about paying off McDougal. How important was this? This is also very important because it is a circuitous money trail. It's not mm. a direct line. It's he gave money to him, gave money to him, gave money to her. But as we also saw in Laura's reporting, Davidson says he never even talked to Trump directly. He never saw Trump. So there has to be some way the Manhattan DA can pinpoint Trump in the middle of this. He is the defendant, even though all these other people are the ones who exchange the money. So having that recording, having some relevance of Trump being there, being involved, even if he didn't technically write that check was very important. Mm. Let's talk about the latest on the gag order, sort of this whole other like sub storyline going on in this courtroom. So prosecutors, they claim that Trump has now violated this four times. They said they're not looking for jail time, but do you think it could get there? Ultimately, it's possible. But look, the whole point with the punishment for these violations is deterrence, right, to stop the defendant from doing this again. And it's weird because Trump's team almost seems to be angling for jail time, in which case would that even be a deterrent if he does get in jail? And then obviously there's the huge First Amendment issues, not just of Trump not being able to campaign, but it's also been ruled that it could possibly be a First Amendment violation to the public to not see their own presidential candidate campaigning. Mm. So I think it's tricky. It's ultimately wow. the judge's discretion. So we'll see what he decides. And he doesn't really have anything to look back on to say, oh, right. this is how they handled no, this kidding. before, because it's all new territory. <laughs> That's exactly right. All precedent-based, all of these decisions, and there's no precedent. All right. Let's talk about today. What can we expect? What are you watching out So for? we're going to see this data analyst come back, and he's going to talk more about Cohen's audio recordings and what he extracted from Michael Cohen's phone. But what I'm most interested in seeing are these other witnesses who might possibly sway the jury. When will Hope Hicks take the stand? The reason why she's so interesting is that all of these other characters who we see on this witness list are potentially 
very shady, right? They're involved in this very seedy world. But she was not necessarily tied to all of that. So what will she say? And then obviously waiting for that star witness, Michael Cohen, and maybe even Stormy Daniels. But again, I'm waiting to see the prosecution keep tying this back to election. Like we are really still stuck in the weeds of this hush money deal. But the felony is if it interfered with the election. Angela Senadella, as always, we appreciate you. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.